to attest to that. Just... Yeah, so we'll close one of them. Yep. So we'll start in the middle of the class. All right, I guess we're just going to start in the middle of the class. So. <clears throat> uh, yeah, unfortunately, now it's just the dry stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, don't worry. I did something earlier to it. <laughs> okay. And then finally, you have your obstructive shocks. So who can tell me what are some... Well, they're up on the board. Anyways, so what's a pulmonary embolism, guys? Blood clot in the lungs, right? So you end up with a blood clot in the saddle between the two lungs, and so blood can't get in there to do a gas exchange, right? Cardiac tamponade. Who wants to take a stab at that one? Heart blockage. But what kind of heart blockage? Yes. I like your style. Okay. So cardiac tamponade would typically be like uh, a bleed within the pericardial sac. So the pericardial sac, there's actually a membrane that's around the heart. Uh, it's a very uh, fibrous material, but if there is a bleed inside there, it can actually start crushing on the heart where it'll prevent the heart from pumping efficiently. Note the difference between a cardiac tamponade and cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock being there is something inherently wrong with the heart versus a cardiac tamponade where you actually have pressure that is squeezing the heart. That makes sense? And finally, attention pneumo. Okay. Um, who wants to take a stab at that one? Collapse lung. Okay. So it's not only just a collapsed lung, but um, it's where the air pressure within the uh, pleural space of the chest actually becomes so much it can actually start to shift uh, organs to one side or the other due to blood or uh, air pressure. And the treatment for that would be like a needle decompression. Okay. Questions on any of the four types of shock. So we have uh, distributive shock, which would be considered what? Something's wrong with the distributive shock. Okay. Well, what part of the system? So if you're talking about plumbing, Yep. So there's something wrong with the plumbing, right? Distributive. Uh, obstructive shock. Something's, something's stuck, right? Cardiogenic. Something wrong with the pump. And hypovolemic shock would be considered not enough hydraulic fluid. All right. Okay, so fight or flight, obviously we were talking about the baroreceptor, so who wants to take a stab at what baroreceptor means in that one? So what is baro? Mueller? No, that's true. <laughs> Pressure, right? So Barrow would be pressure, pressure, right? Yep, so it's a pressure receptor, right? Within the arteries, it senses if there is an increase or decrease in pressure. And so it'll then stimulate the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So what are some things that are going to happen when you're on adrenaline, okay? So obviously blood vessels tend to constrict uh, to the extremities. Uh, cool, clammy skin, diaphoresis. Um, who here doesn't know what diaphoresis means? Okay, so diaphoresis just means sweating. Okay, uh, what you'll find is is when somebody's in shock, uh, they're going to be extremely uh, wet to the touch. Okay, they're going to be moist to the touch. Yeah, I knew somebody was going to do that, but also. Once epinephrine starts hitting the system, 
the kidneys are are the blood vessels to the kidneys are going to start shunting off, which means less urine output. That's not necessarily something that you're going to see in the field. That's more or less going to be something that is going to help doctors and nurses uh, to see how is their body perfusing. Um, Epinephrine is also going to start shunting off blood flow to the stomach and intestines to the GI tract. And so you're going to typically see nausea and vomiting, as well as increased heart rate and contractility from the heart. All of those things, fight or flight. Okay. That has a distinct smell to it. So when someone's diaphoretic, it's a difference between working out and sweating and uh, an adrenaline release diaphoresis. It's got a real sweet smell to it because they're getting it's all that stuff that's being released into the system. It's sweating out through the pores. Yeah. It's got a distinct smell. You'll, you'll get to know it. And you'll definitely notice when you're on scene, you're trying to put like a four lead or a 12 lead on them. Sometimes you just got to get a piece of gauze and wipe it down because it can uh, like pools of sweat. All right, so we talked a little bit about compensation. So the body senses this hypoperfusion and attempts to compensate it. So like I said, this is like your 15% to the 30% blood volume within the body. The body is going to start to compensate for it. So it's going to regulate how much volume is in the body, starting to shunt off vasoconstriction, cardiopulmonary response. Like I said, heart rate goes up, breathing goes up, but blood pressures are typically going to stay relatively stable, okay? It's when you start looking at decompensation when if you start to see your blood pressure start to drop, start to get on it because that's a bad sign. So for pediatrics, uh, children are incredibly good at compensating until they don't, okay? So, uh, I think I remember reading in one book for like a neonate, there's only about maybe like 24 ounces of blood within the uh, blood, uh, within blood vessels and everything. So when they start losing blood and everything, that's definitely something, hey, you got to shunt that stuff off because, I mean, they're tiny. They don't have a lot of stuff. They don't have as much compensatory mechanisms. And like I said, they'll, com they'll compensate for a long time until they don't. Uh, when it comes to pediatrics, never, never wait for a drop in blood pressure to identify shock and, uh, fast heart rates, key indicator for shock among pediatrics. Now, obviously pediatrics, they're going to be running at a higher rate. Okay. But it's always important to keep in mind. Also, don't just look for blood on the ground. Okay. Uh, case in point, like I said, uh, kind of had that uh, trial by fire one month out of going to EMT school. Uh, guy had several GSWs to the chest. However, there was very little blood on scene. Who can take a stab at why I didn't see that much blood on scene, even though that there were several GSWs? Internal bleeding, right? The plural space, right? So I may not necessarily see like, oh man, there's a lot of blood on the ground, but there could be internal bleeding. Questions, complaints, cries of moral outrage. Okay. Like I said, we're just hammering through. Yep. So decompensation, this is where the body is going to start using up more fuel. Uh, so think of it in terms of this. So by the time they're in decompensated shock, okay? So the blood vessels have already started to vasoconstrict, increase heart rate, increase breathing but there's still not enough nutrients or gas exchange going to the cells. So have you guys gone over to Krebs cycle? Okay, aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Do you guys remember that stuff? So which one's more, um, which one's more efficient, aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic. Anaerobic, right? Or aerobic, I'm sorry. Heard you wrong. So aerobic is much more um, efficient in keeping the cells alive. Once you go into anaerobic, it's starting to offload not only 
not enough ATP, but it's also giving off pyruvic acid, lactic acid, things like that. And then you're going to start to see acidosis in this uh, sort of uh, situation, okay? Which is an increase. Uh, do I call it increase or decrease in pH? pH would, would be decrease on there. Yeah. So basically, the bloodstream is becoming more acidic at that point. So some indicators of decompensation, that's where you're going to start to see the drop in blood pressures. So you're going to see the drop in blood pressures, a uh, alter mental status. You're not able to decide if uh, Mickey Mouse is a cat or a dog. So, um, hey, all right, she's listening. So uh, you're also going to see heart rate and respiration start to drop. This is the point where you are behind the power curve. Now you're going to have to fight to get back into it. Fight. You were saying don't wait for dropping blood pressure because by that, I mean, if possible, because by that time, decompensation is much harder to pull something out of. Yeah. Now you can pull somebody out of decompensation. However, at that point, you're going to need like ALS. You're going to need like fluids. You're going to need whole blood product, platelets, red blood cells things that can start to replenish what was lost from the body. Okay. And then finally, you go to irreversible shock and death. So the vasoconstriction, like I said, is going to be a short-term solution to a problem. With the vasoconstriction, it's shunting blood off to non-essential areas, but those areas still require blood. And so with those starting to vasoconstrict, you're going to start to see cell death, okay? Uh, once the organs begin to fail, that's what we consider irreversible shock and result in apnea or cardiac arrest. And at this point right now, you also got to remember that we might be able to bring them back, but then you start having the other issues like ARDS, DIC, um, multiple system, uh, multiple organ system failure. So you never want to get to the point where you're behind the power curve. You know, if you see shock, you want to treat it as soon as possible. All right. So patient assessment, uh, obviously. So your ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, uh, circulation. However, if you're having somebody who is hemorrhaging blood, Right, so we're talking about an uncontrollable uh, uh, bleeding from the body, okay, where you're gonna have to throw a tourniquet or pressure or something like that. Now it's CAB, right? Yep, because it's great to have a great airway, but if he's pumping out all his blood and everything, you got some issues. So recognize, com uh, uh, recognize the body's compensation, uh, you know, with shock. So, you know, you're looking at that increased respirations, 20 to 30 respirations a minute. Uh, heart rate is going to be tachycardic. So it's going to be above 120. All these things are compensatory methods for the body. Okay. You can also take a look at, uh, you know, what's the mechanism of injury, right? Because like I said, not all bleeding is external. Right. Sometimes it could be internal. There could be GI bleeds or uh, in my case, penetrating trauma to the chest and where they're bleeding inside. All those things. Keep in mind, hey, if I'm seeing some things, but some things are missing, start asking questions. And then you go through your primary assessment, you know, your airway, breathing, circulation, make sure everything's good there. Um, and then you can go into your secondary uh, assessments. Um, a little bit, but uh, I don't. I don't think they talk about how like the pelvis and everything things can start to build up. So if you want to go into that, yeah. So two of the places that don't seem like serious injuries that are life threatening are femur fractures and pelvis fractures. A lot of your blood is created in the femur. And so if you get a, a femur fracture that's severe enough, you can actually bleed out from a femur fracture or a pelvis fracture. Because pelvis will hold 
two thirds of your blood and never show. And so if you've got an unconscious patient who's got a severe open book pelvic fracture, you got to start thinking about internal bleeding and what what's going on there. Uh, same with femur fractures. You've got bilateral femur fractures. They're losing a lot of blood internally and you may never see it. So, uh, you know, the gunshot wound's a good example because bullets don't travel straight back. Uh, we had a guy that shot himself in the chest and the bullet, very little blood on scene, no exit wound, but the bullet that actually ricocheted off the rib and went down into the spleen. And he was bleeding out, basically. Uh, another guy shot himself almost the exact same place. Bullet traveled around the rib, mixed it outside, didn't cause any internal injuries. So look for those entrance, exit wounds, look for blood loss. If you got an entry wound and you're not seeing a, an exit wound and there's very little blood loss, assume they're bleeding inside. And that goes back to that mechanism of injury, definitely. Okay, so current, uh, patient assessment, airway, obviously correcting airway issues, make sure they have an open patent airway, uh, especially when it comes to like bleeding in the mouth, make sure that uh, they're able to keep that open airway. Otherwise you're gonna have to have suction or if you don't have suction, like you're in the field or something like that, make sure that they're in a recovery position so everything drains out. Uh, obviously when it comes to breathing, the biggest thing is when it comes to treating shock, high flow oxygen. So we're talking about like 10 to 15 liters on a non rebreather. Okay. You want high flow oxygen because as long as you're able to maintain and get that oxygen to the bloodstream, you're able to help perfuse the body. Uh, but you never want them to become or remain hypoxic. So circulation, so knowing what we know about compensation, what are some things that we might see in terms of circulation? So skin color, you know, are they gonna be uh, warm pink and dry or are they going to be cold, clammy, diaphoretic, and in worst cases, cyanotic, okay? Uh, distal pulses, so what can you possibly expect? Okay, maybe not slow, but you may not feel a good palpable pulse in the distal. So, you know, starting from the outside working in, you're probably going to find better pressures up in the carotid versus in your radial pulse, uh, especially with somebody in shock. A good way to figure out, because sometimes in the field things are hectic and you don't have the time to figure out, okay, how's your pulse? Check their cap refill time. If it's over two seconds, you know that they're being hypoperfused. And heart rate, typically with shock, you'll see that they're tachycardic. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's kind of all we need there. Okay. So physical examination, identify conditions that are associated with shock. Uh, we've pretty much hammered that all, you know, all get together. Um, and then take your history of the secondary assessments. Okay, what caused the injury? Do they have a history of these illnesses? Uh, taking back to like what we're talking about septic shock or distributive shock, you know, does this person have a history of UTIs? Things like that. Um, does this person present with um, like coffee ground stools or is it bright red blood or are they vomiting bright red blood? You know, all of these things, you know, start to take into consideration. Okay, I might be dealing with like esophageal varices or a uh, lower GI bleed. So you're also doing some detective work as an EMT. And then finally ask your patient, hey, what's wrong? That's always a good way to figure out, hey, what's wrong? So, all right. So like I said, we've gone over, you know, the signs of shock, uh, blood vessels constrict, cool, clammy skin, respirations increase, nausea, vomiting. Once the, the biggest thing to learn from this is once blood pressure starts to decrease, now you're going to have to fight to get them back up. 
And that's the biggest thing I want you to take away is have a high degree of, hey, if there's something wrong, let's try and get ahead of it versus wait for it to happen. Yeah, go ahead. It can start to slow down. Yeah, for the most so part. Your product is always going to be your product or your femoral is right down in the junction between the pelvis and the, where the leg meets. Um, those are going to be your strongest pulses. And once they start getting weak and slowing down, you're, you're behind the eight. Now, depending on where they're at in shock, you may still be able to feel the radial pulse, but it's going to be very weak and very thick. And thread means you can just barely feel it pulsing. And if it's that way, you know they're shunting the, the blood away from the, the extremities. If you're doing your calf refill, I know in the book it says calf refills not reliable on adults, but it still is a, a way of assessing whether or not they're in shock. And it's going to be different if they're cold or you know what the weather is outside. But once you start seeing that slower than two second refill, you got to start thinking blood shunt away for some reason. Questions? Good question, though. Okay. So the biggest thing about shock is trying to solve the underlying issue. So, you know, like I said, hair goes in and out, blood goes around and around. Any deviation for that, fix it. Um, Big thing is, though, is that there may be some things that you're not able to do in the field and they're just going to need to require surgery. That's why rapid transport is very imperative and it's actually one of the testable skills for your uh, EMT basic certification, which when it comes to sh uh, bleeding and shock, that, that station should take you 10 seconds. So pretty easy. Uh, use your primary assessment to identify urgent intervention. So obviously, you know, control any hemorrhages and then identify what other treatment needs. You know, do I need to start uh, getting ALS there to bump pressures up? Um, you know, things like that. So, okay. So this is an interesting thing. They added this one uh, from when I went through, but the uh, triad, the deadly triad of trauma, acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. So I already referenced it in the class, but how does acidosis uh, come into effect here? Okay, so how does that occur? Yep, that anaerobic state that hypoperfusion causes. So you're not offloading the uh, CO2, the lactic acid, all that stuff. All that builds up into carbonic acid, lactic acid, things like that, it, thus decreasing the pH, which makes the blood more acidic. The problem with that is, is that it starts to affect uh, the coagulation factors, the platelets, the fibrin within the uh, bloodstream to cause clots. Hypothermia. How, how does that come about in shock? Yes. Trying, your body is trying to keep the body organ warm with fresh blood and whatever, so it cuts off everything outside. Okay. Trying to save your vital organs, so if that, you're not losing any blood, but you're... Well, yeah. They're compensating, I guess. Okay. It's also a matter of the body is not perfusing properly, right? So it's not having as much energy. The uh, You're not getting as much ATP in the body, in the cells, right? The powerhouse of the cell. And so the body is going to start dropping temperature, right? Well, again, problem with that is it messes with the uh, coagulation factors, the platelets in the body which then leads to coagulopathy, right? Body can't clot means you can't stop the bleeding. And so all three of these things tend to come together in what is known as the triad of death. Acidosis from the 
hypoperfused state. The body is unable to regulate its um, internal organs and its uh, body heat, starting to drop body heat. And then finally, the body is not able to clot properly. And so throw a space blanket on these people, stop the bleeding as much as possible, and then rapid transport to the hospital. Okay. All right. So what I just went over, <laughs> pretty much. So shock positioning, I know that they were uh, saying in the book, uh, elevation can help. I've read some things that say yes, some things that say no, but hey, if anything helps, you know, use it. Um, consider advanced life support, ALS. So that way we can start replenishing fluids uh, to the person. But like I said, uh, just replacing fluids isn't necessarily going to solve the problem because IV fluids like normal saline, they don't carry oxygen. The only way that you're going to be able to perfuse the body is with red blood cells. Yeah, go ahead. So like back in the old Boy Scout days, you know, treat, teaching like how to treat shock, right? Obviously get them warm, elevate Let the feet. Elevate the feet. What, what is the thought process? Uh, from what I remember, it's the whole like vasoconstriction, dilation, everything. If you lift up your feet, it brings all the blood back to the center, uh, the center of the body. And so it can be pumped out more efficiently. Okay. That's, that's the thought process behind it. Okay. And obviously like if you don't have, like, let's say you're in the woods or something, you encounter shock, you don't have bag valve mask or supplemental oxygen. What can you do to like prevent hypoxia or do you just try to do these other things until you diesel therapy, get them to a hospital. <laughs> that is, uh, that, that is a bad day if you're going into shock in the middle of nowhere. That's just a bad day. And that, but it does bring up a good point. So say, for example, you get called to an ATV rollover up on Laramie Peak. Okay. Uh, how long is it going to take for you to drive somebody down with internal bleeding versus calling life flight? Or, you know, say you're, uh, you know, 43 miles on 59. Okay. Uh, and somebody is, you know, in shock or a trauma red or something like that, you know, do I take the time it takes to drive 40 minutes into town or should I get life flights and send them to the nearest applicable trauma center, which would be, uh, Casper. What's the thought process behind, like, you should always have, like, if in your assessment, you think you should have ALS, you should call them because you can always call them off later. Absolutely. You may not. Absolutely. You can call off life flight. Well, because we didn't know what we had, sounded bad. Get there, it's not as bad. Tell me, go back and land. You know, and they're, they're fine with that. Mm -hmm. The pilots need hours, so. Yep. And 10 there in the air, it's fine. Yep. And, you know, we, so an example of that would be Laramie Peak. Uh, Jen and I had a call. That from the time we got the call to the time we entered the doors of the ER was nine hours. So life flight couldn't fly because of the weather. We were ALS. So, you know, we ran out of oxygen, had to call down to fire uh, fire department got to stay with the truck, say, hey, send up another bottle of oxygen. And so and also send anybody in the campground. We're getting tired of carrying this guy down. So yeah, it's you use the resources you got. What's the like average time frame of like if you're unable to provide hypoxia? How long, you know, I guess it totally depends on the situation and the patient, but is there like an average metric of how long the body can stay in shock before? No, not really. And it, it really is. So, yeah. Like fitness and yeah. mm -hmm. age affect that. Yeah. So. You know, when I got in my car wreck, it was from the time we got in the car wreck to the time they got me out of the car, I was going up. And it was 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's fire department having to get there, ambulance having to get there. You know, by the time they got me in the back of the truck, I mean, I was full, clammy, diaphoretic, and the whole works. And I knew I was going to the shop. 
Do you have like yeah? I was gonna ask you. Yeah. Do you have like a decent level of consciousness? Oh yeah, I was awake and alert all the time. So, um, but yeah, it's just a matter of yeah. You bought each body's gonna be different. I mean, at that time I was running Spartan races. I was working out all the time, so I was in shape. Could I do that now? My body probably wouldn't handle that kind of damage now. So. And you can think of it in this way, in terms of like shock. Uh, think of like an hourglass, okay? Uh, there's only so much sand in that hourglass. Once I flip that thing over, I'm on the time, right? And so there could be like a little small hole in there and it trickles out a little bit at a time. I could punch a lot of smaller, you know, a bunch of small holes in there, which will make it all come out a little bit more or break the glass and have one big dump. So. You know, that's the reason why, you know, you can't necessarily say, is there a timeline for somebody to be in shock? If they're in shock, at that point, you're on the clock. Um, I no noticed they... Like we're in such rural situations here. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I noticed they didn't have it in this book, but like in some other books, they talk about like the golden hour, okay? Like from point of injury to higher level of care, you want to get them within one hour, there's also the platinum 10 minutes where if you can get somebody who's in extreme trauma to a hospital within 10 minutes, even better. Um, but, you know, remember when it comes to shock, especially compensated shock, the body can only last for a short period of time. Uh, it's a short term answer to the problem. Yeah, go ahead. I'm almost done asking. That. Go for it. Is it at all possible for the body to ever pull itself out of the chest? No. I, no. Not without, because usually there's something causing the shock. Yeah. Okay. So whatever's causing the shock has to be fixed before it's going to be fixed. So like your septic shock, you have an infection somewhere that's out of control. Yeah. If the body could have stopped it, it would never have gotten that far. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm just thinking like the body mechanism pre medical intervention. You know. Body's pretty amazing, but there's usually shock is when the body's done everything it can, it can it can no longer sustain. So think about it as you know like blowing up a balloon. Okay. You, the balloon is designed to hold so much air pressure. But if you keep blowing that balloon up, blowing up that balloon, it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker until it pops. And that's kind of what shock is. Shock, shock is just slowing the inevitable. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm open. Let's have a discussion about it. So, all right, go ahead. All right. So, initiate rep. Yeah. Loss of blood. So uh, the question being, how long does it take for somebody before uh, organ failure starts to become an issue? Yeah. Okay. So like for the example, say for like the heart, if there's like a heart attack or something, almost immediately it's starting to kill cells. And once enough cells start dying due to hypoperfusion at that point now you're starting to look at um you know it not being able to do its job effectively and that's how you end up with like a myocardial infarction like you know heart death um same thing goes for like um you know the kidneys end up shutting down because they're not getting perfused once you uh stop supplying blood to these organs 
they they start dying very rapidly there's not a set time i would say but um say for example like the brain okay if it's not getting sugar and oxygen readily you're immediately going to start to see deficits does that make sense you're gonna you're gonna start to see um problems with these organs relatively quickly if they're not getting what they need does that make sense yeah and the brain's a good example i mean after three minutes of no oxygen to the brain it starts to have issues with memory and and you start seeing the altered mental status after about five minutes you're looking at possibility of losing consciousness and then after 10, 15 minutes, you're looking at brain death, where parts of the brain start dying. And pretty much after 20 to 30 minutes, there's no coming back from it. You, you're going to see brain death. Even if you get the heart started again, get them breathing on their own again, they're not going to be the same person they were prior to the incident. And so... Each kidney or like each kidney, each organ has its own threshold of being without blood. The kidneys and the heart and the brain are probably the more susceptible to being without oxygen. And so once you get that oxygen depletion, that's what we're talking when we're talking about perfusion, is the blood supplying oxygen to those kidney, those organs. And so once that starts to deplete you're going to see decreases in functions and stuff like that. And it's timetable. You know, we're not, neither one of us are doctors. So, you know, you get someone who's really into the endocrine system and stuff like that. They can probably give you actual timelines on it. But that's why we don't worry about it. We just get them to the hospital, let someone else take care of Diesel therapy. All right. Um, so we're going to start into bleeding. Let's go ahead and just take a five minute break. Got out of Brian's Brant's. Oh. Probably driving trucks. Oh. Yeah, and they know uh, what I had to do to record that. So I just, yeah. I just jumped in. Yeah, I need to. What I want to do is do like a class that on Zoom. So the instructors, and then put a little note up here that says press record because I always forget it. Too. And, uh, I put through the class and I'm like, oh crap, we go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just have them do record. And if you do in the future, you just come down here to get this screen to come up and come over here. And it's got. I was recording, you stopped recording. Yeah. Okay. You can, you can crash at any place. What? You can crash at any place. Where is that? Oh, getting anything from this class? You got four guys. No, it's all right. No, it's great. I don't know what they did when they stabbed me this weekend, but what? Oh, I got blood drawn this weekend from a PHA, oh. and it has itched in that side oh. ever since then. I'm excited to actually be able to do stuff. Cool. Like that that OD at the high school the other day, I could have come out and been like, I know where the alveoli and the carina is. Do you guys need that? 
If I gotta throw a, you know, suction tube and everything in an easy tube, it's like, all right, here, take this. <laughs> Wholesale six month class. They're like, Peter, what did you learn? I know, I know where the career is. <laughs> Mr. Brown said that was the most important thing. Yeah. There, That's it. That used to be a question. I don't know if it's still. Really <laughs> yes. I know you have to know it for your EMTA or your AMT. So. Right. Yeah, it was a question on every test I've taken so far for National yeah. Registry. Is where the crino was. The crino. Crino. See, I didn't even say it right. <laughs> um, do you guys recommend doing the NREMT exam in person versus like the online? Uh, well, it's it's an online course. I mean, you have to take it online. So oh, the test. Yeah, the test yeah. is online. No, I just mean so, like going somewhere where it's proctored because it sounds like a lot of craziness. So I happens? recommend. Oh, good. Where it's proctored. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to like pick up your computer, show them the entire house. If someone walks behind you, they stop the test. Ah, so yeah, I have a five-year-old. Yeah, four-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. probably better just going in and doing that. Yeah, and it's the same price no matter what. So go get the strip search and take the test. <laughs> they cut you down. They put in your glasses. <laughs> I have to do it for my um, certifications for yeah. CS. Yeah, now Tanner says that if you do it at the college, it's a little less strict than Pearson view is. And so. I'm surprised Tanner didn't show up today. I haven't seen him all weekend, so. He got all the way down to Denver to take his firefighter test and realized he forgot his wallet. Oh, he had to have, so said so he went and bought a new suit and bought some running shoes. So he said it wasn't a total waste, but and he has the option of taking it at home, but right. he just was a little frustrated. Yeah. Get a new suit from this wearing. Okay. Oops, we lost somebody else. Where'd Garrett go? Like, I know I'm boring, but come on. Everybody left for me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Let me give us five minute breaks for Pete Brown gets his tent. What the heck? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I'm hourly. Um, yeah. Like I came back and everyone's still in their seats. It's like, ah, great. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to be going into bleeding before I go into that. What are the four types of shock? Euler. All right. Give me one, guys. Come on. Okay. Um, let's let's talk about pathophysiology pathophysiologies of shock. So causes hypovolemic shock. Okay. So what does that mean? Yep. Lack of volume, not enough hydraulics to keep the machine running. Okay. What's another one? Okay. That would be, yeah. Cardiogenic. Okay, so what is cardiogenic shock? Problem, Problem with the pump, right? Okay, so we got hypovolemic, cardiogenic. Anaphylactic. Anaphylact okay, so anaphylactic shock would be a subsection of what type of shock? Distributive. Distributive, right? Okay. I know. I knew I was going to love this class. All right. So distributive shock means something wrong with the plumbing, right? And finally, what's the last one? obstructive right and what does that mean in terms of shock yep there's a blockage so okay 
All right, so let's go into types of bleeding. So obviously hemorrhage would be that severe bleeding that's going to need some sort of intervention in order to stop. Uh, major cause of hypoperfusion in trauma. When you guys get uh, uh, further on in your uh, studies, you'll go into like your H's and T's, which is way beyond you know your pay grade right now. But um, one of the T's happens to be trauma so it's always a good thing to know and you can uh rate bleeding in terms of external bleeding and internal bleeding okay all right so external bleeding this would be the stuff that you see and everyone freaks out about so arterial bleeds you're gonna see that spurting effect right uh pulsatile flow bright red blood so who here has gone hunting okay does anybody not know what I mean when I say that crimson bright red blood? Okay, that would be that arterial. Okay, versus veins, which tend to be a steady flow of blood, unless you block it off, which then it gets real interesting. But uh, with veins, you're talking about that slow, steady flow, right? Um, like I said, by the time the blood gets back to your heart, heart's refilling at what point? Systole or diastole? Okay. All right. And then you have your capillary uh, bleeding, which would be your slow, even flow. That would be like the paper cuts, your abrasions, lacerations, things like that. Okay. So external bleeding occurs outside the body after force penetrates the skin, lacerates or destroy underlying blood vessels. Um, so it really does depend on the size and severity of the wound, size and pressure of ruptured vessels, and the individual's ability to clot. So, like I said, going to like um, Douglas Care Center, where uh, you have people who have like atrial fibrillation, and so they're prescribed like blood thinners, uh, warfarin, uh, things like that. Um, you might see a lot of bleeding, okay, especially from a head injury, okay, but is it a hemorrhage, okay? So that'd be the difference, okay? Uh, don't rely on just seeing how much blood's there on the ground, okay? But size and severity of the wounds, obviously, I don't have to go into that. It's pretty self-explanatory. And size and pressure of ruptured vessel. So, um. I know they were talking about it in uh, the book, but what are some very sensitive areas, I guess is the best way to put it, where you can see a lot of bleeding from? So uh, like with the junctions, okay? The axilla, the armpits, in the groin area, uh, the arteries and veins tend to be closer up to the surface and so they're more susceptible to this stuff. Also, if you're at the range and catch a ricochet in the leg, I highly wouldn't recommend it because, you know, size and severity of the wounds, those tend to suck. Um, but yeah, so things to keep in mind about. Do you want? So you can, um, at times, tell a considerable difference between an arterial bleed versus a venous bleed. Venous blood tends to be darker in color, while arterial, because it's more oxygenated, tends to be much brighter in color. Um, you can also tell if you've uh, put an IV into an artery because it tends to back up into the IV. But um, to answer your question, yeah, you can usually tell the difference between arterial bleeding and uh, venous bleeding because the venous bleeding tends to be much darker. It's typically what you'll see with a normal bleed. Like if you cut yourself and everything, that's typically what you'll see. Cut yourself. Yep, don't run with scissors. Drink your milk. Yep, so massive hemorrhage, arterial bleeding, we're talking about that bright red blood, oxygen rich, and tends to correlate with uh, 
the heart rate, the spurting effect that you'll see. Um, okay. Venous bleeds, like I said, typically to be darker, less pressure, so it's not like spraying across the walls unless they do something weird and try and put a tourniquet on there, which blocks off venous flow, but not arterial flow. At that point, it gets real interesting real quick. At that point, you're calling a nurse over because it's like, oh, I didn't expect that. And the volume of blood carried by some veins can create immediately life-threatening hemorrhage. So what are some of these veins that we're talking about? Does anybody want to take a shot? Not quite. <laughs> Well, you know how varicose veins come about, right? It's there's something wrong with the main uh, vein in the body. And so the body produces other veins to try and perfuse the other areas. So there's usually something wrong with the main artery or main vein. That's the reason why you often see them wear like compression stockings. So, but, uh, okay. I mean, I'll retract my statement, varicose veins. Okay. What are some other things? Jugular veins, right? Setting about like an inch underneath the skin. Uh, so jugular veins, um, you can also figure like, uh, um, who knows what the name of the main vein going to the heart is. What is the main vein that collects all the blood and brings it back to the right atrium of the heart? So if the aorta is the main artery taking blood away from the heart, not quite, no. Vena cava? cava? Yeah, big old vein, you know, runs up through uh, the center of the body. So, um, yeah, you know, jugular veins tend to bleed a lot, um, kind of training trauma to the chest, obviously, goes without saying, but the vena cava, you know, things like that. So, all right, so junctional hemorrhages. So we can thank the military a lot for our current understanding on how to deal with these things. But a junctional hemorrhage would be basically where the appendages attach to the body. So the axilla, the armpits, or the groin area, uh, those would be what we would consider junctional, right? So uh, large arteries and veins are not very well protected. Like I said, you have your brachial arteries, you know, that run underneath there. You got your femoral arteries that run, uh, you know, in the groin area. They also connect right up at the groin. So things to be uh, cognizant about. Uh, injuries to those areas will cause massive bleeding. I know the army got away from it for a while, but they said if you had like a groin bleed or something, you'd drop a knee into it. And that's what they still teach at Fletzy. So still get taught it, huh? Yeah. So, but yeah, so junctional hemorrhages, um, I think we're probably going to go into uh, wound packing a little bit later, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll leave that for later. But uh, yep. So junctional hemorrhages, just remember, it's where the points connect to the trunk. Some other external hemorrhages, capillary bleeding, slow ooze, they tend to stop relatively quickly. You might have to put some direct pressure on it, but, you know, put a little direct pressure on it and, you know, typically within five minutes, it might stop bleeding. Uh, all bleeding needs to be stopped. Like I said, all bleeding will stop eventually. That's always a good maxim to live by. And identifying the type of bleeding is almost irrelevant when it comes to capillary bleeding. It's going to stop. That would be your abrasions, like your small lacerations. But like I said, don't just trust on what you see on the ground because a head injury to an old person who has warfare or something like that will look like a crime scene. So uh, things to keep in mind about. Okay. Bleeding can be accelerated 
Warfarin, prescription medications limit the body's natural ability to form clots. Hypothermia can also do this stuff. Uh, and external hemorrhages can usually be controlled by just direct pressure. So direct pressure and, you know, maybe a pressure dressing, you know, at most will usually take care of these things. Nope. So we'll teach you how to do a pressure press. I'm not doing it very good though. Just by using that. And some curl X. Yep. So when it comes to external hemorrhage, if you have this available, highly recommend it because there's some nasty people with nasty stuff out there. Gloves, mask, eyewear, gowns, and please wash your hands. Um uh take it from me you know arresting somebody who was bleeding and possibly had hiv and everything the next six months are very stressful on you so you don't want to do that stuff um like i said if you have the ability throw that stuff on okay at the very least do not touch people without gloves that's just nasty people are nasty All right, so let's think about this, okay? So the hypothetical, how, uh, huh, I wish they had something more up there. So uh, say for example, uh, respond to a traffic crash, okay? Out on Highway 59, you end up getting up there, uh, you end up finding, uh, you know, there's been intrusion into the cab, subjects bleeding from the leg, okay? So take it away. So take me through top to bottom, okay? So you get called. Mechanism of injury is a uh, high-speed traffic crash with vehicle intrusion. You get there, you end up finding that the guy's bleeding. You know, call it a, we'll just call it that, okay? So what's some questions you want to ask? First thing you want to ask. Am I going to get struck? <laughs> First thing out of your mouth when you go in to take your cup. Hey, all right. Am I going to get, you know, am I going to get injured doing this stuff? So, all right. So BSI scene safe. Okay. Take it away. How many patients do you have? Okay. So you have at least one patient. Okay. What are some other things that you want to do? Okay, consider C-spine. What are some other things you want to do? That's the patient if he was alone. What'd you say? What'd you say, Garrett? I said, ask the patient if anybody else was with him. Good. So you're able to confirm how many patients you have, right? Okay, so you've confirmed one patient. Uh, you know, one patient considering C-spine, what's your general impression? Okay, you have vehicle intrusion, right? So possibly start thinking maybe trauma yellow, things like that. Go initiate some protocols. So, all right. If this guy is possibly bleeding and you're a BLS crew, what's something that you may want to consider? Consider ALS. Good. All right. So you get to the guy, he's in his driver's seat, and you notice that he's bleeding from his leg, okay? What are some questions you need to ask? Start going through your head. Okay, so is it a massive hemorrhage? Because that's going to dictate, do I look for an open airway, or do I start controlling the bleeding? CAB versus ABCs, right? Okay. So how does that affect the priorities of treatment? Hey, how about that? We answered our own questions, okay? Um, all right. So fire department gets there. They are able to extricate this guy out. Um, but before they're able to extricate, you notice that it's bright red pulsatile blood. Okay. So possible arterial bleeding. So what should your treatment be at that point? Are you going to do ABCs or CAB, uh, CA, CABs? Okay. So try and stop the bleeding, right? 
Okay, so you got a femoral, whatever. What are you going to do with it? Okay, since it's an extremity, okay, you're able to use a tourniquet. Okay, if it was, say, in one of the junctional areas, what are some things that you would think about? Hemostatic dressing, start, you know, packing wounds, right? Okay, so you've already were able to identify that this guy's got an arterial hemorrhage, right? So you've placed a tourniquet on him, you're able to extricate him out. What are some things that you want to start doing now? High flow O2, right? Prevention of shock, which means what? Get them warm, right? That triad we were talking about, right? So if you can stop the bleeding, okay? Stop the bleeding, helps with the perfusion of the body. Put a blanket on them, make sure that they're not gonna lose any body heat because you want all the coagulation factors that you can, okay? Um, finally, you know, do what you need to do, tourniquet, junctional, uh, wound packing, things like that. And then finally, Rapid transport. Get him to the hospital. Yeah, this guy. Back. This guy needs a. This guy needs a doctor. Yeah. All right. So, does everybody see how that affects your CABs versus your ABCs? Okay, I know it's a little bit dramatic, but that's just who I am. Okay. All right. Identifying control of massive hemorrhage within the first seconds of primary assessment. And then you look for your patent airways and adequate respirations. Okay. Uh, control non-massive bleeding only after assessing and treating the prior elements, okay? If it's just a cut to their head, but they have something like their dentures stuck in their throat, which one takes priority? Make sure that the airway is open, right? All right. So be aware and look for those symptoms of shock. So uh, I remember hearing a story uh, from one of our other uh, medics. So um, a guy gets ran over by his tractor. Okay, get there, transport him up to the hospital, and then you look at his blood pressures and you're like, okay, he's 100 over 60, right? Well, I mean, on the surface, that doesn't look too bad until you figure out that he never took his blood pressure medications in the morning. So what are some things that you're going to have to start asking yourself, okay? Is this guy possibly bleeding internally, okay? Like getting run over by a tractor, breaking a pelvis or something like that pelvis, pleural spaces, you know, the stomach, all those places can hold a lot of blood and it may not look at from the outside. You can also take a look at the EKGs and it's kind of interesting. So, all right. Question, you know, kind of yeah, go ahead. Okay. So internal bleeding, right? Hmm? What did we do with all that blood? Is it like a... It stays there until they get to the hospital? Higher level of care. Higher, yeah. yeah. Higher level of care. Um, that's going to be your big thing is, uh, you know, get them to a higher level of care. And is again, though, eventually? Does say it, what? Is it trained eventually or like? Oh, eventually it will be. Yeah. Once they split you open and, uh, you know, are able to repair the damage that's inside. If you bleed into the first chest tube, then you have to back up in the end, that means brown. It'll get sucked out. I have a little vacuum thing that puts a little bit of pressure on it. Mm -hmm. Suck the blood out. Yep. But yeah, big thing is, like I said, just because something's bleeding, don't automatically assume, oh, this is a massive hemorrhage. Okay. Take a look at the whole person and figure out, okay, is this a hemorrhage or is it just bleeding? Because if it's just bleeding, I need to focus on my airway, breathing, and then I can worry about, you know, covering up the wound. But if it's arterial bleeding or a junctional bleed or something where, okay, I need to do something immediately now or else this guy's going to have a harder time trying to compensate later, then I need to fix it. But don't wait for the symptoms of shock to appear before starting to treat it, okay? Keep your patients warm. Get them on oxygen if they need it. Um, but you don't want to wait until they're at 20 to 30 respirations and their blood or uh, pulse rates at like 140. You know, you want to start like get ahead of it now. If it's a stab that's caused massive bleeding, the object is still leave it in. Yeah. Uh, 
rule of thumb, okay, if there is, say, for example, like a stab wound to a foot or something like that, you just take rolls of curl X, set them on the side to make sure that it uh, stays in place, and then you just wrap the entire thing together because the minute you take that knife out, you've basically opened up an open wound at that point. At least with something in there, there is the possibility of it shunting the blood. Okay? Because the minute you take that out and everything, and if you're not at a higher level of care, now you're going to have to deal with an open bleed. And if it's severe enough, you may not have what it takes to uh, get ahead of it. So a good example of that is a um, guy back in the previous cargo that stabbed Rick the hospital. Talked about uh, Steve Irwin. Okay. Oh, yeah. Steve Irwin dove into the water, got stung in the heart, or stabbed in the heart by a stinger. The stinger, uh, the spike, actually broke off the stinger. When they brought him up, it was still in him. They pulled him. And he pretty much died immediately. Had they left it in, there's a possibility that that would have closed off the bleeding and slowed his, his rate of decline down. And so those those are instances of you know, the guy in Chicago walks into the ER with a knife in his heart. They left it in, took him up to the, uh, the OR, pulled it out of him, sewed him up, and he's still alive today. Mm -hmm. Now, these are cases where you don't want to be pulling stuff out because when you do, it opens up those blood vessels that start to allow them to. Okay. It's, kind of the, it's kind of the same thing with like packing wounds with curl X. Understand, it's not so much the blood being absorbed by the curl X that's stopping the bleeding. It's the pressure that the curl X inside the wound is causing on the veins or whatever the bleed is. And that's what's shunting off the blood flow. Okay. So, okay. You were, um, you were saying that this is, uh, so we were about ABC compared to what? Uh, other CABs. What is it? CAB. CAB. Circulation airway breathing. In the event of a massive hemorrhage, okay? In the event of somebody bleeding uncontrollably and it's going to require some level of intervention okay i'm going to focus on the hemorrhage versus airway because if i open the airway but he runs out of all his blood well that's going to be the big issue the army has gone from uh abcs and cabs to a march algorithm which, uh, you know, is your list of priorities. In the Army or the military, they teach treat massive hemorrhages first, then you have your airways, respirations, uh, circulation, then uh, pit injuries and hypothermia, all that stuff. But for our purposes here, CAB, in the event of a massive hemorrhage, which is going to require some sort of intervention, you need to control the circulation first. Okay. So methods in controlling external bleeding, obviously direct pressure. We've been talking about that. Even if it's just a gloved hand, putting it onto a wound just so you can you know, put pressure on it, that helps. Chemostatic agents. So this would be like your quick clot, your cur uh, quick clot, your Cheeto gauze, your uh, Celox. Um, all of those things have... Uh, I don't know what you would call it. Additional stuff impregnated into the uh, bandage to help with the clotting factors. Like quick clot, for example, when it first came out with a hemostatic agent. So when you poured it into the wound, or later on when they put it in dressing and you put it on, it actually cauterized the area, caused a, a thermal reaction that would basically cauterize the area and stop the bleeding. Um, Kytosin was a big one that came out that was supposed to replace that because what they were finding is you put this stuff in and it actually caused well, burns. And so now you had burns on top of a gunshot. And so they came up with Kytosin, which was a really good idea, but the problem was it's made out of shellfish. Yeah, so yeah. they're looking pouring this on people, all of a sudden they're having anaphylactic shock. Oh my God. 
<laughs> so. Now, thankfully, they've addressed some of these issues. Like I've heard that Cellux and Cheeto guys were the ones that use uh, KSM or something like that. But that's the uh, stuff from shellfish shells. Um, quick clot is actually almost like a clay, almost. And they found ways to prehydrate it so you don't get those third degree burns. But that's the reason why, um, you know, you've seen some people with like gunshot wounds, but they have scarring throughout their arms because they've got, you know, quick clot on there. And the only way to take care of third degree burns is to debride it out, cut it out. So, um, but nowadays, most, you don't typically see the pellet uh, quick clot anymore. Most of the time you'll see like combat gauze um you know that's impregnated with this stuff so and that all helps with the um that all will help with the coagulation wound packing so you can wound pack without like quick clot or anything like that you just have like roller gauze and basically how you know how they teach it like at fletzy is roll it up into a ball stuff it in there as far as you could 12369, 12369, and basically you fill a softball size uh, amount of gauze in a wound cavity. And that's how you would typically work with like junctional bleeds. Uh, tourniquet the extremities, and then uh, thankfully, like I said, uh, with the military, there are specialized compression devices for junctional hemorrhages. There's one made by Sam who makes our Sam splints. That I know of. There's also one that's uh, made by uh, TACMED out of Australia, I think. Basically, it looks like uh, you take a the Lucas and everything like that, but it just has a big round thing and it just puts pressure right on the uh, joint there. Yeah, they make them so that you can do both sides or just one side, but it just fits around like a belt and it's got these two. Like, I think the Sam one has two turn handles on it and you mm -hmm. push it down into it, into the junctions, and it costs it off. You can take it, wrap it around the chest and put it up into the axillary areas and stuff. But yep. I haven't got to play with them. Me neither. <laughs> it's kind of like that uh, great white buffalo. It's what you hear about, but you never see. So. I know why they keep it around <laughs> the knee thing in CLS army is. Yep, drop the knee into. Drop a knee into the groin. So this is going to be a really weird question, but my brain thinks way differently than most people. Mm -hmm. So quick clot, something that you put in the wound that helps coagulate and absorb the blood, correct? Yeah. It helps with the coagulation, yeah. So if you're in a real pinch and you're out in the boonies and you got this huge freaking bleed and you've got someone who has toddlers filling diapers, you rip one of those open and put that in there? Um. So... So like with the, you're talking about the absorbent material, right? Okay. So I would be very cautious of that because here's the thing. So does anybody know what the atmospheric pressure is of just, you know, say at sea level? No. Does anybody know? About 760 millimeters of mercury. What is the blood pressure in the body? Okay. What? I said that is a total Rudy thing to know. Uh, well, you know, what I'm trying to say is that atmospheric pressure is actually less than what is the pressure in the body. And so there is a possibility of putting stuff in there, it getting sent into the bloodstream. So it would be better to leave the diaper intact, intact and <laughs> shove it on there. Yeah. But I like your style. <laughs> it's just something I put in mind because we got curious one day with our twins and we looked at the absorbing stuff in a diaper and I'm like, yeah, because you know, you, I don't know. Yeah. Female pads. Yep. Yeah, that would work. Now, too. We get away from it. So in Vietnam, my brothers used to carry hand mm -hmm. for grandchildren. The problem is, what have they done with tampons today? They're stuffing them now that you don't want to be shoving into a wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they blow up nice and big, they stop the bleeding. But there's stuff in them that isn't necessarily good for the, the bloodstream. So you don't want to be using that, but like feminine pads, um, gauze is cheap. I mean, you can get, um, I'll bring in some kits on 
Monday that I made up for a class I'm going to be teaching. You know, but basically that entire kit has tourniquet, four by fours, ABD pads, and gauze in it. And it cost me less than 20. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, they're amazing. I mean, it's really cheap. You can go down to Walmart or Safeway and, and get everything you need for a kit and have it in a Ziploc bag. I have, I have in my car, but the only thing I don't have in there is furniture. Yep. Now, it is actually kind of interesting that you bring it up because, like I said, with the military advancing our medical knowledge, uh, they came out with a thing called an XSTAT, which basically is this little syringe. It's not little, but basically it goes into, say, like a GSW, and when you press it in, it actually has these uh, little um, circular deals that expand and basically it's like a sponge. And I think if I'm not mistaken, there's actually a photo of it in the books called an X. Yeah. Yeah. And basically they expand and it works the same as wound packing. Um, do they carry TXA on life flight? Yes. Okay. 811. Okay. Um, so yeah. And then, um, well, they don't need to know about TXA right now. So, all right, uh, carrying on. So controlling external bleeding. Uh, yeah, it's essential for preventing shock, you know, because how do you prevent or how do you fix shock by fixing what was broken before? Shock is a symptom. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, nerve wracking symptom that you have to fix. But the way that you fix it is fixing the initial problem. Uh, uncontrolled bleeding can lead to patient death. Like I said, all bleeding will stop eventually. It's not a question of why, it's a question of how at that point. And standard, pro uh, standard precautions are mandatory. That would be mask, eyes, gloves, gown. Um, make sure that you observe those things because with the world, I mean, you have hepatitis A through Z at this point, uh, HIV, uh, there's plenty of other stuff out there that you really don't want to mess with. Um, it's just nasty. So, okay. And you never know if you have an open wound on your hand, so you put that hand sanitizer on it. Yeah. And you know very much. With my job as a simple sterile tech, that's part. That's the big thing in our job is the precautions because it's what we deal with every day with body fluids. Yep. If it's wet, sticky, and not yours, don't touch it. Yep. So it's not going to hurt, but it's not as effective as just washing your hands with soap and water. Yep, soap and water is better because you're actually getting rid of the stuff off your hands versus hand sanitizer. You have the stuff on your hands, and it'll kill the germs you know, the alcohol in those things will try and kill the germs, but you still have the stuff on your hands. Like, you know, I had a case, you know, with the PD, had a guy end up shooting his car and then punch out his window and his hands were bleeding all over the place. And well, they ended up getting all over mine, you know, his blood. I didn't have gloves on. And so I looked at the next guy next to me and it's like, Hey, do you have hand sanitizer? He dumped a whole bottle of hand sanitizer on my hands, but I still got blood on my hands. So at that point went into the store, washed my hands off and was on bloodborne pathogen protocol for six months. It is not a thing I recommend. Does that just change, like change your outlook on in the PD, like putting on gloves from then on? I've never forgotten to wear my gloves now. <laughs> Needless to say, but that's the thing. Okay don't you don't want to mess with you know the stuff out there hiv hepatitis uh you know that stuff can kill you just as bad all right so direct pressure apply firm pressure to the wound with the palm of your hands or your fingers if it's you know something deep in there you know you have to use your fingers don't necessarily recommend it but it is what it is hold pressure until the bleeding is controlled and then so when they say applying layers of absorbent dressing, so um, back when my dad was in Vietnam, how they dealt with like a bleed 
was okay you put a trauma pad over it and once that soaks through you throw another trauma pad over it and then you tie it down and then when that soaks through you put another trauma pad on top of it the problem is is that you keep adding these layers how effective is the pressure the downward pressure on the wound okay so the more that you stack it up the less downward pressure you have Direct pressure is what you need in order to stop the bleed. And so even though you may throw an abdominal pad onto a bleed and everything, you're still going to need to have that pressure on there to stop the bleed. And it used to be tough. I mean, it still probably is tough. You broke down it. But to this step, yeah. But yeah, you, once it soaks through, you put another layer on. Well, it used to be tough that when I went through and People went through recently, you just keep adding layers on, you never catch the initial layer off because you're bring, you're yeah, you're taking away the contact. So now if it bleeds through two sets of gauze, turns it. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. In the army they, they teach you that the amount of pressure or the tourniquet you put on should hurt worse than the wound itself. That's what they you should feel the that you have wound right here, the pressure you put on it, they should be complaining about how much pressure you're putting on it instead of Well, and it's also important to note, just because you throw a tourniquet on and it stops the bleeding doesn't necessarily mean that you're done, okay? Because you, remember, arteries are deeper in the body and are also muscular in nature. And so when you stop bleeding with a tourniquet, you may have stopped the venous flow back to the heart but you haven't stopped the pulsatile pressure going into the extremity. And so that's the reason why when it comes to tourniquets, they often say, you know, give it three cranks and you shouldn't feel a distal pulse. That makes sense? Okay. How about that? So when we bring, when we start working on tourniquets and stuff, we'll have them have you apply one to yourself and crank it down so you stop. Stop your own pulse. So, and then you can take it off. So one thing about applying a tourniquet that's important for you to understand, I don't think they go about it in the book, is when you initially throw a tourniquet on, that sucker needs to be torqued all the way down before you even start cranking on the windlass. Okay? So uh, just because you're cranking on the windlass doesn't mean that you're stopping the blood flow. By the time that you pull that belt tight on the extremity, it should already feel tight on the person. And then you start cranking on it. And after about three turns, that's, you know. But the reason why it also hurts more is because not only are you uh, blocking off the veins and arteries, you're also pinching off the nerves. And that's why it hurts so much. Okay. All right. Once the bleeding is controlled, bandage dressing firmly in place to form pressure dressing. So that would be once you've, uh, you know, put a... A uh, piece of gauze over a wound or something like that, you would wrap with Curlex distal to proximal. Okay. You don't want to be pushing blood into the extremities. So you'll start low, work high. Uh, do not remove a dressing once it's been placed on the wound. Obviously, in order to prevent uh, destroying any clotting factors that have already put themselves in place. Start low, work high when you're wrapping it. As much as possible, you want to start distal to proximal. Okay. So wound packing, this would be for like your junctional bleeds, uh, which present natural cavities to promote profuse bleeding. Um, so you fill the voids with hemostatic gauze. So say for example, like a penetrating trauma to the groin, you would not only put uh, gauze into the wound 12369, but once you've uh, filled up the hole with you know packing material, You'd also throw gauze over the top and you would still provide downward pressure even after filling up the void. Okay. And that's just to help with augmenting the clotting factors in the part of the body. Make sense? Everybody understand that 369? Yeah. Top location. Yeah. So when you're pushing that dressing in, you're actually bringing your finger in and going to three, six, nine. You're going making a full circle as you're putting that stuff in there. Yeah, I did. So uh, do we have any roller gauze? 
Yeah, you you would think of it as the face of a face. That's okay. So you took one is twelve o'clock, one is three o'clock, one is six o'clock. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. When you're packing a wound. Two dressing. Yep. What about Yep. You you basically just want to fill the void as much as possible with as much gauze as you can. So uh like uh for the PD, one of the things we did was we brought a pork butt in, uh a pork roast, <laughs> and then stabbed it. And then we started shoving gauze into it. And you'll be surprised, A how, how long is a roller gauze? Like sometimes three. three feet? Yeah, you can shove full three feet into a stab wound on a uh, pork butt. It's actually a really good way to practice is, you know, you actually have that, you know, fleshy material and everything. And you just work. You roll up a big, you know, a little piece on the tip. 12, 369, 12, 369. You can fit a full three foot uh roll of gauze into a uh wound like that put it on the smoker when you're done give me a look for more than i all right we can't afford pork butt but we do have <laughs> <laughs> we do have wound factors that you get with flavor. okay so pressure dressings place several gauze pads on the wound hold the dressings in place well with a self-adhering roller bandage so uh, this would be like your Israeli bandages. Uh, this would be um, your Olay's bandages. You'll commonly see those in like trauma kits. But basically, it's a method to provide pressure to the wound. That way you can uh, provide direct pressure without you having to provide it for you. Uh, big thing is you want to create enough pressure to control bleeding. So... Um, You'll commonly see things like this in like trauma bags, you know, like the uh, North American Rescue makes them, uh, TAC Med makes them, things like that. But uh, some of these things, and you can make your own, you know, uh, put that on there and then use your Curl X, wrap it up tight, just hold proximal, and then, yeah, uh, you can roll it up that way. So we'll show you some tricks just using gauze to make good dressing. Hemostatic agents designed to enhance the direct, uh, direct pressure's ability to control bleeding. Like I said, this comes usually in impregnated gauze, your Cheeto gauze, your quick clot, uh, things like that. And these sort of things are best suited for packing wounds. Yeah, we, we've beat that to a dead horse. This will be your quick clot combat gauze. And uh, impregnated in the uh, gauze is actually the active ingredient. And that's actually one of the older ones. That comes in a roll. They have them in Z-folds now. And with the Z-fold stuff, you just pull it out as you need it. Makes it kind of easy. The nice thing about it is they have taken the burning part of it out. I don't know what the what quick, quick clot did to change their formula. Yeah, but they did something to it. That they it they prehydrated the kaolin, is what I understand it. But they, whatever they did to it, it doesn't cause the thermal reaction. <sighs> Many people are alive because of stuff that we've learned. Unfortunately, a lot of these things are, you know, these lessons are built on the tombstones of others. Everything in life is trial and error. Absolutely. You'll figure it out hey, fake it till you make it, right? All right. So the turn kits closes off all the blood flow to and from the extremity used if bleeding is uncontrollable by direct pressure and to be used on extremity wounds, not around the neck. <laughs> um, so a lot of people were really concerned about using tourniquets at the beginning of the GWAT because the old adage was life or limb, right? Okay. Well, the whole reason why that came about was because the first uses of like tourniquets in combat and everything were like in the Napoleonic era. And from the time you put a tourniquet on to the time that you get them to a hospital could be as many as days or weeks. 
Well, after eight hours, that's when you're going to start to see cell death in these extremities. And then they have to amputate. With modern technology now, you can throw a tourniquet onto a wound and it could be hours before they need to take it off. Tourniquets have been used in surgery for years, long before the GWAT. Okay. So I think we've finally gotten away from the whole life or limb, you know, sort of thing. And we're actually saying, hey, if it's not controllable, if direct pressure, throwing, you know, a pressure dressing over it and it bleeds through, if it's not doing it, throw a tourniquet on. You just throw a tourniquet on anyways, then? No. Not quite. Yeah. That's the major bleeding. I mean, because most stuff can be stopped with four by capillary bleeding. Oh, yeah. And it does start from Now, one of the things when, when I went through EMT basic, it was applied direct pressure, that didn't stop it. You raise the heart above the elevation or the wound above the heart. Mm -hmm. If that didn't stop, then you use pressure points, stop the bleeding. If that didn't work, then you use a pressure blank bandage. It was just all these steps in the last resort for the turn. And so there was all these steps between initial contact to actually stop the bleeding. And if, if it's bleeding that bad, you'll recognize it right away. We had a wreck out here on 59 that they had direct pressure. And when they showed me the wound, it was pouring, blood was pouring out. And so I was just like, oh, pulled out the tourniquet, put it on. You know, because one thing, we still had to get him out of the truck. The truck was over an embankment. There was no way of holding direct pressure to the wound the entire time trying to get him out. So threw a tourniquet on him, tried to uh, splint the arm the best we could so we could get him out and then take care of him. And then once we got him into the, the ER, they took the tourniquet off and worried about controlling it. So, yeah, if it's major bleeding, throw the tourniquet on right away. If it's not major bleeding, apply the um, So you get them to the hospital? As long as the <laughs> limbs saved that I've heard so far was 17 hours. Okay, so how no, the guy still has an arm, still works. No. And in surgery, they, they, they'll put it on and it could be on for the entire surgery. And some surgeries take five, six, seven, eight hours. Okay. And what they'll do is they'll loosen it up every once in a while. Mm -hmm. and they'll like use them on focusing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We have that to my brother when he went into the motorcycle accident. He died on the table, so he was unstable in the middle of surgery. So they tourniqueted his leg, so they took him out of the coma for yeah. a couple of weeks before they did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so <clears throat> big thing to know about this stuff on the rig, we carry one tourniquet that I know of in the trauma bag. Yeah. So God forbid you ever have to use this knowledge, but how else can you form a tourniquet? Okay. Um, So uh, we do still carry triangle bandages on the ambulance, right? So the biggest thing is that you want to have a patch of cloth at least two inches wide. And basically how I've always done it is wrap around underneath and come around so you have full, uh, full surround of the injury. And then put your uh, windlass on there, stick or something like that. Tie one, tie two, and then you can start uh, doing that stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe we're going to cover this later, or you might have already. It, but what if, what if the limb is torn all the way off? Happened to a buddy of mine, actually. Took his arm off. So, like, if it's as long as there's like a part of the extremity you can throw a tourniquet on, if it's like right at the axilla, that becomes a junctional hemorrhage. And so at that point, you're wound packing. Am I wrong? Yep. Okay. And the, the nice thing about the body is in a traumatic amputation, 
a lot of the first reaction the body does is all the arteries and everything suck up and they close off. So you don't see a lot of bleeding right away. It's once they start decompensating that the body will start to relax and then they start bleeding out. That's just a natural thing. So um, usually traumatic amputations that are quick and fast, you don't see a lot of bleeding. Now the cleaner the cut, the more bleeding you see. So you know, God forbid you get into a sword fight with someone, they lop your arm off. You're gonna see more bleeding with a sharp sword over someone getting their arm torn. Yep. Wound packing is what? So wound packing would be like taking roller gauze and pushing it into the wound. What we were talking about, the 12369, just packing wounds. Um, that would be the concept of like wound packing at that point. The arm is off. How would you pack? I mean, if you have a void, if you have a cavity, you would wound pack. Otherwise, you're taking an abdominal dressing or something like that, and you're just shoving it into place. A handkerchief would be a, a tourniquet. You can use a handkerchief as a tourniquet. It's yeah, it, it's more or less the size. So like a triangular bandage, I mean, those suckers are pretty wide, all things considered. A handkerchief, the concern with using a handkerchief is depending on the size of the extremity as well as the size of the handkerchief, you may do more harm than good. Because at that point, you might be pinching the stuff off rather than uh, providing pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. The, uh, what, what all? The nerves. Yeah. The nerves. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and that's how a lot of damage can happen. Like you can end up with neuropathies and things like that. Especially the thinner the tourniquet, or the thinner the item you're using as a tourniquet, the more damage it causes to the muscle and the tissue. So if you think of if I take something that's three inches wide and I wrap it around something and squeeze it, does it do a lot of damage? If I take a piano wire and I wrap it around something and pull on it, right, right. So the thinner it is, the more damage it's going to do. So that's why we used to carry on the truck a tourniquet that was basically looked like a big zip tie. I uh, they were stupid when <laughs> we got them. Yeah. But one of our doctors was, I mean, well, a friend of his was the guy who invented it. And so he got them for a really good deal and thought they were really good. But they were only about a half inch wide, maybe an inch of color. And the amount of damage, I mean, I tried to put it on myself and I couldn't get it tight enough by myself to get it to cut off the circulation. And it took two of us pulling on it to get it tight enough. And then it hurt like none of them. And Luckily, it was one that you can also release it, but it was also very easy to release. And so it holding that pressure was, for one, how wide it was if you kept it on for a long period of time, it starts to cause damage to the muscle and the nerves. And two, it would probably loosen itself up and start bleeding before you got it caught it off. Yep. So <clears throat> that's a picture of the mechanical advantage tourniquets. Again, great white buffalo. Never seen it in my life. All right. So obviously follow the manufacturer's instructions for your purposes as an EMT. You're not to remove or loosen this stuff. And then uh, make sure that your other providers know that a tourniquet's been applied. Okay. Um, a lot of tourniquets like the uh, North American Rescue, they have some that are like fluorescent orange. That makes it really nice. Otherwise, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I carry a Sharpie on me and I'll just write a T if I needed to. Thank God I've never had to do it, though. Almost all the tourniquets now come in um, bright orange, black, desert tan. You know, you can get the highly tactical cool stuff but you know like the ones that i carry the ones i bought i bought 
some to try out and they work very well and they're made by Recon Med Medical. They work good enough that out of all the copycats out there, cat tourniquets sued them to stop production. <laughs> and so they've had to stop their production. So you can't get the ones I got anymore. But you, know, yep. you can get a lot of cheap ones out there. Um, I haven't tried. I know the ones that we carry are not, they're cat copies, but they're not cats. And I don't know. The soft tees are what we carry on the rig. Yeah. yeah. No, so uh, we don't carry those. We don't carry the soft tees anymore? Oh. Well, well, we used to carry a soft tee, which was a nice one because it had like an alligator clip to pull it through. But soft tee changed their design more to the cat style. The nice thing about the soft tee is they're a little bit wider. And so I like them a little bit, the design of them a little bit better. But there's tons of them out there. If you go on, uh, Amazon and look up tourniquets, you're going to find a bunch of cat copies. Mm -hmm. Be careful with what you buy. You get what you, what you pay for. Yep. Um, that's why I like about the recon was because they changed the windlass to an uh, aircraft aluminum windlass. Um, I threw it in the freezer and let it freeze for like three or four days. Took it out. No failure on it. Um, mine's not clinically good enough for some of the people out there, but you know, I like it. I trust it, but and I've used it in the field a couple of times. So it never Can you make your own tourniquet? What would it be if you did not have those items that were used in the well? You have to make your own tourniquet. What would you use? Would be the best. So depending on. The material, like the belt that I normally wear, has holes for the little locking things all the way down. So I could get that belt tight enough if I really pulled hard and lock it into place, probably make a tourniquet. You think about like dress belts for the military, the little slider belts. You could, if you really pull hard enough, you could probably get it tight enough. Problem with the belt is you're never going to get that twisting. So you want something, you want a piece of metal or a piece of wood or something to work as a windlass so that you can crank down and get that pressure on. Like Rudy said, with triangular bandage, you would start, I, I always start on top of the leg, wrap it underneath, come back up and tie on top. And you put one tie on top, Put your windlass in there, do two ties on top of that, twist it till the bleeding stops, and then do your best to tie in place. And we'll teach you all this stuff um, coming up here in the class. Yep. All right. We're going to try and press on because I kind of want you guys out of here by 9.30. So junctional tourniquets designed to control uh, junctional bleeds at the axle and the groin. We've hammered that pretty well at this point. All right, so is the current method of bleeding working? So take, for example, our previous incident, okay? Male subject, one patient uh, involved in a traffic crash with intrusion, bleeding from the leg, and you notice that he's bleeding from the leg, okay? So what are you guys going to do? Okay, so you've applied direct pressure to the blood uh, to the point, and you, know it is, you notice it is bright red and pulsatile. Okay. Okay. So you apply a tourniquet. The question comes: Where do you apply the tourniquet? Okay. So yeah, you can do high and tight. I've heard two to three inches above injury site, six inches. Okay. Um, now here's a question: You throw a tourniquet on a person, it doesn't stop. What are you gonna do now? Secondary tourniquet, right? So you're going to place another tourniquet proximal to the wound or proximal from the wound, right? And you're going to apply a different, another tourniquet into the point, right? So, you know, do you need to move on to a more aggressive step? How would you evaluate this? Basically, how would you evaluate it? Is it working or not? <laughs> Has the bleeding stopped? Has the bleeding stopped? Yep. 
So, all right, good deal. We'll carry on. Okay. So other methods to control bleeding, obviously there's the elevation. If you have an extremity, you can raise it higher above the heart. Um, unless there's some sort of injury, you know, like a, you know, broken bones or spinal injury or something like that. This would be more for your capillary bleeds, to be quite frank about it. If you have a venous bleed or a arterial bleed, elevation is not going to stop it. And so you're going to have to go with like more aggressive means of intervention. But if it's like, hey, you know, I just cut myself on my arm and everything, direct pressure, hold it above, you know, hold it above your heart, it can help. Um, they're also going to talk about positioning. So, uh, you know, there used to be the whole Trachtenberg position where you had the legs elevated. Now just have them supine on the, you know, cot. Trendelenburg, that's it. Okay, so splinting, uh, able to stabilize those uh, sharp bones. Um, so this would be like for your femur fractures, you would want to use, um, you know, one of your, uh, uh, I'm blanking out, what's it called? Uh, for a uh, femur fracture, the splint, traction, traction splint you know, using a traction splint because not only is it going to realign or not only is it going to stabilize those sharp bones, but it also realigns uh, the bones in place. And so, you know, you're not going to have as much bleeding at that point. Yeah, go ahead. If your bone's sticking out of the skin, you still use that traction, traction splint just to pull the bone back in, right? <sighs> If I'm not mistaken, traction splint, that would be a counter contraindication. So the thing with the traction splint is you can only use it in certain cases. So if it's big enough that you have an open fracture to the thigh, you have to think you have fracture below the knee or closer to the hip um, because then it's counterindicated. contraindicated. Yeah. But if it's, you know that that fracture is mid femur, and there's no other fractures, then yeah. Because one of the things that you got to think about is what are the biggest muscles in the body? The quads, right? So what happens is when you get that fracture, those muscles will contract, and they'll keep pulling that that um, muscle and bone together. If you start pulling it out, then yeah, it's going to pull that bone probably back in. And but think of what will happen if that if you don't do anything, and now that that muscle starts to quiver, what's well, also running right down the middle of your leg or, or inside your leg, the femoral artery. So you start having those jagged bones get too close to that femoral artery, you can make it cut it. And now you got a major bleed going on, as well as fracture. So don't worry about it and just get that. On yeah. yeah. Now you want to make sure that your patient is, you know, being well taken care of, but um, yeah, with broken bones and everything, providing manual traction actually will help relieve some pain for them. So, because I mean, you're not jabbing them with the uh, broken pieces. So there is that uh, cold application. Oh, air splints. So um, we don't carry them on the rig. But some, uh, some agencies have like uh, air splints, which are kind of cool. But yeah, um, I mean, if you have, what are those? The pneumatic PASG or something like that. I can't, so, the mast pants. <laughs> so the mast pants used to be a thing. Uh, pretty much nobody carries them anymore. Because mm -hmm. uh, one thing, they're hard to use. Two, you can't see anything once you put them on. And three, it just didn't work all that long. You know? mm -hmm. uh, they really, they found that they caused more damage than good. Uh, some of the things you'll see out there, you get your, your air splints. The problem with an air splint is what type of material it's made of. When they first came out, they were red. And 
not opaque. You couldn't see through them. So once you put that air splint on, you couldn't see the injury. And they made it very hard to reassess the patient. Some of the newer ones are clear. Um, you also have your vacuum splint. I think there's some pictures in there. Um, with the air splints, you wrap it around the leg, you inflate the air into it. With the uh, vacuum splints, you put it around the leg and you suck the air out of it. Hmm. And for back boarding someone, the vacuum splints are amazing. Really? Because you put them on it, suck the air out of it, and it forms strength. So it, it covers all those gaps that would, you would have on a, on a backboard and secures the entire body. Um, we've never carried them. I know the mines used to carry them. I don't know if they still do or not. The problem is they're really expensive and they buy them. Yep. So. And you can also throw uh, like a cold pack on bleeds. Um, but again, these are more like with the cold application, this would be more along the lines of like the capillary bleeds versus your venous bleeds or your arterial bleeds. But like if somebody has like epitaxis or something like that, a nosebleed or something, I mean, I've thrown, you know, I've thrown ice packs on. So that also helps. Okay. So when it comes to head injuries, this would be one of those special situations. You do not want to provide direct pressure on these things because you don't want to increase intracranial pressures. So what you're looking for is that cerebral spinal fluid possibly coming out of the nose or the ears. You would just place a piece of gauze underneath there and collect it. Uh, but you do not want to increase the intracranial pressures because, I mean, they're already having issues. Um, have they gone over abnormal posturings or anything like that? Okay, I mean... Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways. Uh, yeah, stopping the bleeding uh, from a head injury only increases the intracranial pressure. So you'll just want the drainage to flow freely. Okay. Yep. Epitaxis. So uh, who here had their mom tell them, pinch your nose and lift your head up? Okay. Yeah. Uh, until you've puked out a blood clot and everything, it's not really, uh, really good. So Pinch, lean forward, keep the airway open. And yeah, place patient in a recovery position if they become unconscious. But yeah. All right. So if at all possible, start your uh, hemorrhage control with direct pressure. If that doesn't work, if it's an extremity, what are you going to use? What technique? Using a tourniquet if it's an extremity. If it's in the axilla or the groin, wound packing. Okay. Around the or the groin. So wound packing on the groin. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So any junction where the extremities meet with the trunk, that's going to be considered a junctional hemorrhage. And so the axilla or the armpits are a point there as well as the groin area. Uh, if direct pressure fails or is inappropriate, obviously apply a tourniquet, initiate rapid transport and consider the need for ALS. So, um, yeah, critical care, life flight, they have some drugs that they can use for bleeding and trauma. So, yeah. Uh, say again. So if they are, if you have a reason to believe of inter intracranial bleeding, okay. So say like you have a closed uh, head fracture or closed skull fracture. Um, things that you might notice would be like uh, clear fluid coming out of the ears. That clear fluid is cerebral spinal fluid, which tells you that there is increased pressure in the brain. And so you wouldn't apply direct pressure to a closed skull fracture or something like that. You would, uh, at that point, you would just place gauze beneath the ears to collect uh, the runoff and rapid transport because 
So I'll just get into it. We were talking about abnormal posturing. So you have decorticate posturing and decerebrate uh, uh, posturing. If you see somebody with a head injury and their you know, body is kind of pulling in toward the core, um, that is a really bad sign. That shows, okay, we possibly have intracranial bleeding at that point or intracranial pressures going up. If you start seeing their body extend outboard or outward, that would be indicative of de uh, decelebrate, uh, which basically means there's enough pressure on the brain to start forcing the brainstem through the foramen magnum at the base of the skull. And basically it's herniating the uh, brainstem at that point. And that would be, uh, at that point, the only treatment for that is uh, drilling. And that can only be done at a hospital. So basically, if you have an open skull cap, you know either internally you got that sign of uh, clear fluid or blood coming out of the ears, or you have an actual open wound, you don't want to put any pressure on there and cause pressure to build up in the skull. So in those cases, you're just going to lightly place a dress. Now, if you know it's, you know, they got a good laceration to the head and you can see that, you know, you feel around it, there's no depression, no weakness or anything like that, then you can go ahead and put direct pressure to that type of a wound because the wound is at that point superficial to the, to the scalp or to the face or something like that. The head wounds bleed. They don't, I mean, if, as far as I go, if you've ever, guys in here ever nicked yourself shaving, it takes forever for that little nick to stop bleeding. Um, so, yeah, it does tend to bleed a lot more than, say, a, a hand wound or something like that. Very venous, very, a lot of capillaries in the area. So, yeah, you're going to put direct pressure to those type of wounds if you know that there's no damage to the skull. But if there's damage to the skull, you want that pressure to be released off the brain. And so you don't want to put any pressure on it. Yep. All right. So let's talk about internal bleeding. So obviously, damage to internal organs or large blood vessels can result in a large quantity of blood being lost in a short period of time. So we're talking about like uh, traumatic injuries to the liver, spleen, um, kidneys, um, you know, things like that. Those sort of things can cause a lot of internal bleeding. Also pelvic injuries. Uh, the pelvis is very venous. And so there can be a lot of bleeding associated with that. Typically you're not going to see blood loss at that point. You may notice discoloration like, uh, you know, rapid bruising on some of the flanks. Um, you may notice bleeding from the anus, vagina, or uh, uh, places like that. Uh, that may be indicative of internal bleeding. But really, when you, it's a more or less looking at the mechanism of injury that, hey, I need to be aware of this can cause internal bleeding. Does that make sense? You don't. You don't. Yeah. Yep. Diesel therapy. So, like I said, mechanisms of blunt trauma that may cause internal bleeding, high, uh, high falls, MVCs, pedestrian collisions, blast injuries. Uh, blast injuries are kind of interesting because um, uh, what was it? We had uh, like a pressure explosion at one of the rigs or something like that. And that can cause similar effects to blast injuries. But uh, with those, you're talking about like barrow trauma. So, you know, the hollow organs tend to collapse. Solid organs tend to lacerate inside. Those are the sort of things where uh, you're not going to stop it in the field. That's the stuff where you got to get them to higher level of care. Okay. Common uh, penetrating traumas, GSWs, stab wounds, impaled objects. Um, I've already told you my story of dealing with that stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, you may not notice, you know, bleeding 
because they may be bleeding internally into the pleural space versus, you know, an extremity shot or something like that. Okay. So signs of internal bleeding, injuries to the surface of the body. So like I said, uh, bruising, swelling, tenderness over vital organs. So it's incredibly important to know that if I'm palpating the abdomen and I notice that this person is guarding their upper right quadrant, what's a possible organ that I need to know about that could be injured? The liver, right? So it's incredibly important to know, uh, you know, to palpate these areas. Uh, painful, swollen, deformed extremities and bleeding from the mouth, rectum or vagina, vagina, whatever you want to call it. Uh, tender, rigid or distended abdomen. Um, so people with like GI bleeds, you'll typically see um, like vomiting ground, uh, coffee grounds or bright red vomitus. That kind of tells you where is this bleed at. If it's closer to the uh, esophagus, you're going to see more bright red blood. So you can start thinking esophageal varices versus, you know, coffee grounds, which may be a bit lower in the stomach area, uh, like ulcers. Dark tarry stools, you'll typically see like with a lower GI bleed or bright red stools, you might see with something closer uh, to the exit. Hemorrhoids and things like that. Uh, and obviously look for signs and symptoms of shock because they may have uh, uh, they may be bleeding into their stomach and so you may see signs of shock but there's no outward signs of bleeding okay so uh, you know you go into the hospital and you find out that their hemocrit or something like that is way low it could be because they have internal bleeding or a GI bleed. Okay. So this might be signs of internal bleeding. Obviously, that looks like he's got bleeding up in his shoulder. I wouldn't be too. Okay. That looks like it hurts. Big thing is maintain your ABCs. If you're dealing with a major hemorrhage, then it goes into your CABs. Uh, consider the need for high concentration oxygen. Like I said, for your... Um, uh, for your sheets that you'll need for your practical skills, high flow oxygen, 10 to 15 liters, non rebreather, keep up there, sat at 95%. Control any external bleeding, apply a splint if necessary and needed, throw a blanket on them, and rapid transport. It's a pretty simple skill station to do. Okay. All right. Yay. Chapter review. All right, so obviously look for the early signs of shock, restlessness, anxiety, uh, pale, uh, cool, clammy skin, rapid respirations, and rapid pulse. If these things continue and you haven't addressed the initial need, these things start to go down and they tend to go down rapidly. Uh, may not be evident during early in the call. So treatment based on mechanism of injury may be life-saving. So that would be looking at what exactly? So looking at mechanism of injury, if you have a motor vehicle crash and you're showing signs of shock, but you know they're not bleeding externally, start thinking internal, okay? Did they hit the uh, steering wheel hard enough to rupture a liver or spleen, something like that? Prevent hypoxia, control bleeding, and keep the patient warm as much as possible. And almost all external bleeding can be controlled by direct pressure and elevation. But when these things don't work, don't go through the whole checklist of, okay, direct pressure, elevate, pressure points. If you get there and they're bleeding and it's not controlled by throwing you know, a hand on it, go to a tourniquet. Uh, and emergency care for internal bleeding is based on prevention and treatment of shock. So if they're internally bleeding, try and keep their pressures up. Uh, yep, early recognition and rapid transport. The idea is to treat the shock before it starts. Mm -hmm. So when we get there, the first thing we're doing is checking them, getting their vitals, doing what we need to do to prevent those early signs. In all, of, in all of the situations, 
Yep. Yep. You don't do anybody any good if you end up getting hurt yourself. Because at that point, now you're another patient. So it's incredibly important for you as an EMT to recognize, hey, is there danger around me? Because you don't do your patients any good if you become a patient yourself. So it's not just for the, for the EMT, but uh, for the patient, if they're not able to communicate, to observe the surroundings, to get uh, possibly a good idea of what injuries they might have, yep. if they're not able to communicate. The starting wheel is broken. Our uh, MCO. Uh, what's another thing? The scene will tell you a lot about what happened. You go call to someone who's laying in, in the front lawn. You get on scene and you notice that there's a ladder laying beside them. Might have been a fault. But there's also a thing of weed killers laying beside them. Okay, you know, there's a ladder just there all the time, and they were actually spraying their lawn with um, weed killer and got a organophosphate poisoning, or you know what what happened to get this person on the ground unconscious. So think about it, rule out stuff. It all works to your benefit. All right, any questions? All right. So so we got two more classes and then we'll be doing a test. So um, I was just looking at, by the way, I forgot to pull the book out. So if you were here on Tuesday, sign it. If you were online, put that you were online um, for a few days. So I already got Bradley and Garrett for today. And then uh, bring your blood pressure cups and stethoscopes on what day is today? Monday? Today's Monday. Wednesday. We'll be going over vital signs. We'll be doing a lot of hands-on stuff that day. So, and then I will have a schedule out Monday for starting ride time. We're losing a couple of nurses, so um, ER time is going to be basically while you're on the ambulance, so we'll get you back there and get you as much patient contact as we can. Uh, make sure you bring copies of your clinical sheets for your ride time so that we can keep track of patient contacts. Uh, next week we'll have uh, what pressure? Yeah, the day, no, day after tomorrow. Oh, this one. Yeah, this one. Okay. And we'll be practicing listening for lung sounds on the mannequin, listening on each other, you know, blood pressures on each other. Um, once you do that, we'll expect you to, in between classes, do blood pressure cups on your family or blood pressures on your family. Those don't count for your. Ones for the yeah, for patient contact, so they're just for you to get more contact with people. Just review for the what, what's the dress expectation. For? So yeah, so we haven't been able to get shirts yet. Um, having a lot of difficulty with the hospital right now, and I don't know if shirts had time to look into making them for us, so. Um, as far as the shirts go, collared shirts, a polo shirt, button up shirt. Uh, we'll get you name tags and I get the pictures taken, I guess. Yeah, you don't get to hide your face. Um, uh, you, you guys have an angle. Oh, no. okay. Have whoever's in charge of that in your car. You know, we might be able to work some time now to use some of your time up there so we don't have to. Yeah, you know, I want you coming down here at least a couple of times, but you know, 
I'll write as many times down here as you let me, because I guarantee you I'll get more hands on patient contact here than I will out there. Okay. Uh, it's pretty good down here. I'll treat it that way, but if it ever is like crappy weather like it was last week, you know, just my time up there. Well, and I can, if if it's okay with you, during my call week or my call shift, if we have patient contact or whatever, I can have them fill that out as well. But it can't be what it was. So it has to be, that's the unfortunate part of the. the State is you cannot be on call or on duty while doing your work or doing your right there. So. I practically live outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll get the schedule out. Um, again, you're probably doing most of your time on the ambulance. I know it says like 12 hours in the ambulance, 12 hours in the, in the hospital, but Basically, we're a hospital-based service, so when we're not on calls, we'll be in the ER. It'll, it'll be good, good experience, a lot of patient contacts. It'll be easy to get your 12 patients. Uh, do we have to wear med pants and med boots during no. our rotation? No. Nice. Yeah. I, so I don't care what you wear as far as pants go. But no holy pants, make it decent, you know, um, look professional. Like I said, collared shirt. Um, like I said, we'll get some name badges up for you. So you know, um, Don't wear shoes that you like because they might get covered with stuff. So be, be smart about it. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. They've seen a ton of Close to old shoes, um, preferably a boot type shoe or uh, like high tops on If we're out on a scene, you don't roll your ankle. Um, nothing absorbent, no cracks. You wear a ball cap, probably won't be when you're in the ER. And definitely, you know, show up with your ball cap on backwards. Uh, that we make fun of you. Um, yeah, just be professional. Nothing with um, bad language on it, graphics. So, so if I don't ask this question now, I will forget. Where did you report to when you go? For uh, ride time, our ambulance is right behind the building here. Um, sometime uh, next couple of classes, we'll take you back there, get your ramp. Um, best thing to do is when you do come in, do right time. Have one of the medics show you the bus. Um, if they're doing something else, you got downtime, go out, go through it, get to know it. Um, most of the people, at least, um, I'm pretty good about being good instructors or being good um, instructors. So, and I also don't care if you're a night owl and you want to do night shifts, you got night shifts available. You actually like sleeping at night and you just want to do day shifts, that's fine. That's Can you do that in increments of like four hours or eight hours? Yeah. Yeah, so, time to do it. Yeah, so if you if if you can only do like a four or eight hour shift just on that day, put the time you're gonna be doing it. Um, our shifts are five thirty to five thirty here. So um was day or night, our shift start at five thirty. Maybe you wanna be here about 15, 20 minutes early. Because that's usually when most of us show up. And it's cold. Can we wear like a hoodie or jacket? As long as it doesn't have any anything graphic or offensive. And if you wear a Nike sweatshirt, that's fine. Um, we do have some spare jackets in the hall that I don't know when the last time they were washed, but they've been in <laughs> lockers for years, so it should be fairly clean. 
Um, if we go out, um, we'll probably get you a jacket just so that you have some high vis if we are out on a test day. Um, if first couple times you ride along, don't be afraid to at least for the first couple of patients to watch. Does, watch. That, does that count as a contact though? Or you have to directly? Yeah, because uh, if you look on, I think on your sheets it says observe or perform. So you can observe and count the kind of patient contact. Now, once we get into blood pressure and stuff like that, you know, I'm one of those people that when I'm training a new person that's actually working for us, they don't say anything within the first 10 to 15 seconds. We walk in the door and we take over. So you need to, you know, once you watch a couple of them and just start getting used to talking and, and, and you know, we go in. Now, for me, the seriousness of the call will be dependent on when one actually answers. Theoretically, on a, a nice, calm call, I'm Jim with the ambulance service. Call us here today, what can I do? Or what seems to be the problem? You know, just go in there and introduce yourself. Start the contact in the ER. We'll go in and do the cells. We'll introduce you and explain that, hey, we've got a student with us today. Do you mind if they do a blood pressure or an assessment? And most people in the ER will be, yeah, sure. Go ahead. They say no. I go to the room and the next um, we might go up on the third floor when they're doing their rounds but you do some blood pressures up there you will get plenty of patient help. 24 hours the 24 hours that you're going to be doing this if you only get 12 patients you should have probably 24 40 patients Everything works smooth. Now, if we get there and it's a slow day, unfortunately, we can't go out and create patients. <laughs> so, yeah, if there's uh, no other questions, we get us out of here. Um, just if you want to check when you get home this summer. Um, and then I have um, one thing. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, that invoice, uh, I'll bring it up in meeting. Okay. Yeah, right? Okay, there you go. And I will get those made. Um, like I said, if I can, um, I'll make up what I can. You know, if we have to give you a little bit of back. Well, the nice thing is, is whenever you need to be back. So, if you want one, just put that on. You'd be at your house. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, Hopefully I can probably follow you, you to your house. Perfect. You want to do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll just meet you over at your place. Sounds good. Um, if I can't make it to class on Wednesday, I've got station members and stuff that I can do bottles with and everything yeah. out there in the class if that works. Yep. If not, I know my family's a busy man. That'll be one thing. Yeah. The CNA used to be. So we used to have CNAs from kind of around here. Oh, here, can you go, Eddie? Go if you want. I think we're done here. Okay, I already went. I don't even know where the mic is. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> go away, everyone. Here. Here. I'll flip it. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll talk to you. When do you do back? Are you going all week? You're still there? Yeah. Like uh, I should be back Friday. Okay. Cool. All right. Oh. Um. Yes. Yeah, I'll try and remember to hit record on it. So.
Um, Wednesday, you'll get the class and we'll try and do some video. Hopefully the video doesn't freeze up. So. Okay. All right. All right. You all, you all look beautiful in this frozen picture. Yeah, I see uh, Shelly's still there. I have a whole <laughs> okay. All right. You have a good night. All right. Bye. Bye.